Hi, I'm Anna Maria Clement here at Hippocrates Wellness, and I'm so happy to be a part for the ninth years for the real truth about health. And this time I take to expose children's paradox. I will expose the literacy crisis, the food they eat, the schooling they get, the clothes they wear, the health they have or not have. And you know, they're so exposed to so much media and social media and pollution that it's not an easy time for our children, for our grandkids. So look, we came to this world absolutely with everything we needed to be and to stay healthy. And during the pregnancy, our mom's cells and, and the bodies migrate back and forth and into mother's bloodstream and then circles back to the baby for 41 weeks. And after the baby is born, many cells stays in mother's body, leaving permanent imprint actually in her body, in her tissues, in her brain. And when we nurse, which is the most healthy way, of course, for any being out there, any mammal, is that when the baby is nursing, the saliva gets into mom's nipple and it actually tells mom's immune system what the baby needs. It's just fantastic and making antibodies and strengthening the baby's immune system. Well, I started off in Sweden and I directed uh, one of uh, Sweden's foremost health clinics. It was called Brandel. And the owner of that was Alma Nissen, who healed her rheumatoid arthritis. And I was in cloud nine, or I was on cloud, cloud nine, seeing what happens when people change to a plant-based diet, when they did fasting, when they did cleansing. Well, that was for one decade. And now I have co-directed with my husband, Brian Clement, Hippocrates Wellness for more than four decades and worked with hundreds of thousands of people around the world. Our medical team has clinically observed the reversal of thousands of diseases and the turnaround of aging for all to that consume an organic green living diet. So this is not a fantasy, this is, not, this is a theory. It's a fact that mainstream science and nutrition has failed to, to um, recognize. So lately, as you've heard, a lot of science actually is finding their way. I, I always say, if we wait long enough, they come around. And now World Health Organization, all kinds of scientific research will tell you, boy, we better go plant-based because that's the only way we're going to survive this huge climate change coming our way. Children grow and thrive well on a vegan diet. Of course, our, my own kids with Brian, they have stayed and, and they are nurturing their children in the same way. But seeing them grow up, on this vegan plant-based diet and how well they've been doing. Uh, they never miss the day of school. I mean, it's just amazing. And, and of course, a lot of parents would worry about a plant-based diet, like a lot of my kids' friends that slowly but surely um, changed to a plant-based diet. And parents would say, what do I do now? I don't know how to feed them. Well, I would bring them home to our kitchen and show them what it means to be plant-based. So loving our children, first you must love by respecting them. Children come to this world pure, open, and ready to learn. Our role is to support them, protect them from corporate and government insanity, as well as to allow them to the freedom to become whole. Not everybody is so lucky. A lot of kids are actually being raised by their grandparents, <clears throat> usually due to the opioid crisis or 
due to uh, incarceration or a young teenage daughter that um, had a child. So that um, often changes their, their life for this child. And, and of course, it's amazing to be raised by a, by a grandparent, but the deal is, you know, we, we want to go home to our parents later. And the same for grandparents. You know, they are invested because it's their grandchild and they, they have unconditional love for that child. But they, they are also a burden because now, you know, I feel like it takes a village to raise a child. And I saw that with my own children here. A lot of our team here actually helped to raise our children. And especially when they were small, the first couple of years before they started kindergarten. So we want our kids to blossom. And, you know, some kids ended up in foster care. And the, many are taken out of their homes because of um, problems in the home. And an opioid crisis, of course, is the number one. And they're taken to uh, foster care, either foster homes or families. but. Well, as you see here, even they tested like 20 different programs and they found that 60% of children had same caregivers all week for one year only. 15% had the same for more than one year and only 11% were assigned a primary caregiver. What this, what this is doing to their schooling and to their uh, self-esteem is very tough for them. It's very tough. So this is uh, Eric Erickson's uh, stages of um, psychosocial development. And he really figured out a lot because of his own journey. What happened with him, he was born in Germany in the mid uh, 18th, uh, 20th century. And he had a problem with his identity as he finally figured out that he never, he never met his um, birth father. And as that was just some quick relationship his mom had and it was not to, to uh, be his dad for, for his life. And he really, he studied under um, Anna Freud and uh, really figured out, and it's still the most Im important, actually, so, uh, um, st it's eight stages that people are still using. A lot of psychiatrists and psycholog psychologists are using this still. And each crisis, he found, uh, actually demands resolution before they, they are ready for the next. And the first one is just basic trust versus mistrust. And that's infancy to two years. Um, developing trust and security and optimism, or we are insecure, we distrust, we, we become negative. And the second one is 18 months to four years. And it's like we want to be proud of ourselves. And, or we have shame. And then three, we are learning the purpose, we're learning initiative, or we have guilt, and this is up to preschool. We learn to imagine our fantasy, and we cooperate with others to lead as well as to follow, right? And then the, then the other opposite is shame and guilt, and we don't know how to play. And the fourth stage is school age to junior high, and child, children learns how to master the more formal skills, relationships, teamwork, sports, homework. Or child are not trusting. So a child who is trusting or they, you don't and you, have, you doubt in yourself. And then you have the 13 to 20 year old and now you have self-certainty or you have self-doubt. And that is also the man and womanhood is established. So number seven, now we experience true intimacy for genuine and for friendship, for marriage, or we have mistrust. 
So then we have the parenthood kind of, we being productive and creative. And once we want to leave a mark in the world. And we have idols. We, we need idols. And, or we have stagnation. And number eight, we have integrity or we have despair. It's amazing. It's still being used as something that needs to be finalized. We need to actually have every step in this in these stages to be finalized so that we can go on and grow and be amazing people and have the blossoming life that we were supposed, that is our birth, uh, birth right, right? So let's listen to our two psychotherapists. Hi, I'm Anna Maria Clement here at beautiful Hippocrates Wellness and I'm here with Andy Roman and Anthony Shannon, who are the two psychotherapists here at the Institute since more than 30 years, who have helped so many people to find out who they are and why they are here and to find a happy and healthy life. Today it's about children, the most important, the most important people on this earth and our ch grandchildren. So I'd like to start with Andy. And so, Andy, what can you share with us? Thank you. Um, what I'd like to say is that we all universally recognize the wonderfulness of children because they're so innocent and so simple and so humble and naturally heartfelt. The good news is that that's really still part of us, so that children are not only the most important part of our culture and our race or whatever, but really it's the most important part of us as an individual, as individuals. So the more we learn to take care of children in a healthy, supportive way, that goes hand in hand with actually caring for ourselves and loving ourselves and being sensitive to our, our, our true needs. There's such a difference between needs and wants and that when we get down to what's real, that's what's important. That's what the focus on that is what helps people get healthy and get well because we're returning to our original childlike nature. So this is such a beautiful topic. You know, but we not only, many of us have kids and grandkids, but we were children ourselves. And I remember what it feels like to be a happy kid. Some of us are lucky to have happy environments and loving environments, and some are not. And so we want to raise everybody to have a happy childhood together. And both Andy and Anthony are fathers and grandfathers. So Anthony, share with us. I'm happy to share some practical suggestions. When we are dealing with children and motivating them to have a healthy approach to life, the first thing is to make them feel curious by certain things that we do, if we can motivate them and make them feel curious, they will be motivated. Secondly, also let them have issues that they want to follow, which will somehow help planet Earth, because they are more aware of the need of sustainability. So, anything to do with protecting the planet, they are also interested, especially they know that they are the future generation. The other thing to help them also to do is to encourage them to feel more abundant. We are not cutting short of their initiatives by stopping them doing from something but by helping them and giving them more choices, more possibilities, and encouraging them. In general, I would say what is most important is to follow the newer parenting style, because I'm aware of two different parenting styles. In the older style, what they are told is you watch the children. When they make a mistake, correct them. 
and if they do good, don't bother them. But in the new parenting style, it is different. When they make a mistake, let them learn from it. But when they do something good, praise them. And so I went very much in favor of helping them to grow with abundance than with scarcity. Thank you. Thank you, Andy and Anthony. Next, we go to the exposure that mom and dads can have by diet, heavy metals, chemicals, and it actually can lead to epigenetic changes. And this can cause changes in the fetus, in the child, and it can show up much, much later on in life. Early development, injuries, experience such as malnutrition, exposure to chemical toxins or drugs, and toxic stress before birth or in early childhood are not forgotten, but rather are built into the architecture of the developing brain through the epigenome. Thus, the epigenome can be affected by positive experiences, such as supportive relationships and opportunities for learning, or negative influence, such as environmental toxins or stressful life circumstances, which leave a unique epigenetic signature on the genes. So what we are exposed to in early development could stay throughout life, but it could be changed if we change lifestyle. I always say in my mother's generation, you could smoke when you were pregnant, and she did, and drink coffee and drink alcohol in moderation, of course, but I think every mother now knows not to do any of these things. So in my life, I was fine with being around smokers until I became plant-based. Suddenly my body said, hey, that is pollution. Don't, don't stay there. So we change as we go. We evolve. We evolve constantly. Epigenetics explains how early experience can have lifelong impacts. Adverse fetal and early childhood experience can and do lead to physical and chemical changes in the brain that can last a lifetime. And that is Harvard that also is saying the same thing. It starts before birth. National Prospective Court study in Denmark found that high gluten intake by mothers during pregnancy could increase the risk of their children developing type one diabetes. Well, and that is a celiac connection, and a lot of people might not be aware of this, that diabetes type 1 often goes hand in hand with celiac disease. This was first discovered in the 1960s. I remember reading from Germany, German uh, university actually was writing about this. Gluten from foods causes inflammation in the gut, causing blood sugar fluctuation. Infant to 18 months old eating a diet heavy in gluten for each 10 grams increased the risk of diabetes type 1 actually 46 percent. So diabetes actually um, activates an enzyme knows, known as uh, protein kinase and that constricts the blood vessels. So this is a big part of other problems like cardiovascular problem. So gluten, when a mother eats gluten when she's pregnant, there is a much greater risk for that child to get diabetes type 1. So of course that would be my advice not to eat gluten while you're pregnant and stay out of gluten for this child. And the German study actually found if you gave gluten to a child that was less than four months old, you quadrupled the risk of giving that child gluten, uh, diabetes type 1. 
So, uh, you know, gluten is like glue. <laughs> Diabetes type 2 sees changes in symptoms, yes. You would see frequent urination. They're always thirsty. They're always hungry. And they definitely feel fatigue. They want this one problem for the, for the old. Now sit with the young. Blood pressure, 1 in 25 all over the world. In America, it's 1 in 7 has high blood pressure, and it's on the rise. It has increased fourfold. 32% of American kids are overweight, diabetic, and have high cholesterol. So they found that in America, the age um, three to five, or two to five, it doubled, the obesity doubled. Uh, six to 11 tripled and 12 to 18, it doubled. We have increasing the foods that made this happen. It, it was never a problem like this before. So oh, what happens? Obese children become obese adults? Yes, absolutely. So over the past 50 years, chronic health conditions and disabilities among children have doubled. I mean, it's, it's just an epitome now of asthma, mental health, obesity, and neurodevelopmental problems. And this is uh, from Robert F. Kennedy, uh, his Children's Defense Fund. And he said, there is no crisis more urgent than the chronic illness affecting over half of our nation's children. We are failing children miserably. Vaccines, since 1990. Now, rea realize that since 1990, when the US began substantially expanding its vaccine schedule, the number of vaccines required for school entry has increased by 260% by 18 years old, 73 doses of vaccines. Vaccine injury, may, many developing chronic illness from all the toxins that are in them. And vaccines are actually bypassing cellular immunity. It's injected into the blood instead of naturally going through the gut and lungs. So your immune system is not alerted like it would for a normal flu or infection. Cancer, in the last two decades, brain tumors are the most frequent solid tumor in children. In 2013, it's estimated that 3,000 children in US alone under 15 years old. And about a lot of this is due to ionizing radiation, environment, pesticides, nitrates in food, the clothes they wear, and we can go on and on and on. Approximately 47 children per day is diagnosed with cancer in US. Leukemia, brain, central nervous system, CNS, it's estimated that there will be 13.7 million cases of childhood cancer between 2020 and 2050. And it will be concentrated in developing countries. And this is CCC, children's cancer cause. This is unheard of. This should not be happening and our children are going through enormous amount of treatments for this, and they will have to be checked on for the rest of their life because the treatments that they were given are also giving them more problems in future, unless they could change lifestyle. I wish every child would know how to go on a raw living food diet and build their immune system up so they never had to face cancer again. 
challenges in the West, behavior and developmental disorder have become an epidemic in children. One in every six children today have been diagnosed with the developmental disabilities such as autism, ADHD, and nearly twice as many boys as girls are diagnosed with autism. And as Dr. Semnet from MIT says, half of the children born today are on the autism spectrum, which means that schooling and family and lots of family breakup, lots of uh, divorces happen due to this enormous stress on a family and of course on the child. The weakening immunity of the West, prevalence of food allergy in preschool children is now as high as 10% in Western countries, but remain just 2% in areas like mainland China. It has to do, of course, with the diet that we, that we have our children eat, what they, they, what they are exposed to. In each of these disorders, either the immune system is overreacting to a trigger, such as pollen, peanuts, or pollution, or it's attacking tissues it shouldn't, such as beta cells in the pancreas in the case of type 1 diabetes, and the intestines in inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's colitis. Risk factors in childhood. Risk factors for childhood obesity, dietary, physical activity, and sedentary behavior, food as a reward, parents' lifestyle, school, school perception, and food presence. Well, if you look back 20 years, we are working much more hours now many more hours now than we did even 20 years ago. We're spending a lot of time on our computers, at work, less time with our children. So there's a lot of temptation for a child to find their own way and take care of their own nutrition. And exposure to, uh, to healthy food is key to develop and preference and can overcome dislike of food. Families who eat together eat healthier. Snacks, portion size, TV watching, 53% of kids are driven to school. We used to walk, we used to ride bikes. It's a totally different lifestyle for kids today. If you think about Rachel Carson, in the 1960s, she wrote the book, Silent Spring. And she made us question environmental pollution. And we're still doing it. We're still here. We're still doing it. So Rachel Carson writes this book all these years ago and made us so aware of what could happen and what was already happening. And now we're still there. And now we're urgent. Now it's urgent time. Now all scientists are saying, oh my gosh, it's happening. It's too late. We have to do something really in a hurry and it might still be too late. This is what our children are hearing. My generation had only positive future. It was a blossoming time. It's different. Our findings show that ultra-processed foods contribute substantially to children and adolescent diets, the teenagers, and many nations, and represent a dietary nutrient profile consistent with an increased risk of obesity. So we have all become addicts. First to food, and second to bad habits. Just like any addiction, we first have to recognize the problem before we change. And this is something I see with the children that comes with the parents here to the institute. 
and they, you know, the first week, it's a lot of different food for them. By the second week, they start putting a little more on their plate. And by the third week, they're standing in line with everybody else to our buffet, and they love it. They love it. So really, the world is trans transitioning to, an, to nutrient deficiency. That's where we are. We are we having food that are not bringing in nutrients for us anymore. So let me show you a typical school menu. <laughs> and the breakfast would be things like sausage, scrambled eggs, hash brown, muffin, banana bread, biscuits, pancakes for breakfast. Lunch could be chicken, spaghetti with beef, turkey, mashed potatoes, meatballs with rice, stir fry, veggies, Caesar salad. So this is what kids mainly get. And a lot of school nurses tell me they come in with nausea and headaches and they have stomach ache after the meal. Yes, it's amazing that we serve food in school, but we could have made it so much better because mainly what we gave our kids was a bunch of saturated and trans fats, sugar, sodium, gluten, all the things that they really shouldn't have had. Baby food, we have GMOs in baby food. So the House of Representatives came out with a study last year, 2021. And they found that, oops, baby food contains mercury, lead, cadmium, arsenic. And they said, oh, it needs to all be out by 2024. So you buy things like Similec, Mfamil, Gerber, Good Start, who combined account for more than 90% of all infant formula sales in the U.S are exposing American and Canadian babies to potentially grave health risk by using genetically modified ingredients. Well, that's only one thing. So imagine this is what we give a newborn baby. It's, it's out of touch. I never made, I never bought baby food. I never made baby food. If you nurse, you nurse for two years, it's the main staple and, and every child is a little bit different and they're going to start wanting to check out what you're eating and drinking. Um, some by 18 months old, some maybe earlier, but most of them, they of course are not ready. They don't have their teeth yet. So naturally, they will eat things like the easy things like fruits that are soft and avocados and juice, a little bit of green juice goes a long way and of course water. So nursing should be the main staple because that will give your child such an amazing immune system. Probiotics for kids. Probiotics help the children who attend daycare. Guess what? They have two to three times more infection than children who stay at home. So they use a lot of antibiotic. They get constipation. They get inflammatory bowel disease. They get often diarrhea. So we would use things like sauerkraut, and um, then we would use like tempeh if you used any soy products, kimchi, and probiotic. Fantastic. If my children and grandkids had a cold, I would make sure they got probiotic. There is children's plant-based vegan liquid probiotic that they would like, and you'll see your child blossom. And even after they, or, and, or during and after that they take antibiotic, but hopefully the less the better, because we have overused it so much in the dairy products, in the meat, the chicken, the eggs, there has been so much antibiotic in, in most of our food. And hopefully we don't give that to the new ones, right? 
So somebody said, raise a child on junk food. Nobody bats an eye. Raise a vegan child, and everybody loses their mind, right? So <laughs> we went through that with our parents when our kids were small, and uh, they were worried. They're not going to get dairy. They're not going to get what other kids, how are they going to feel when everybody else get to eat what the school has? And they pack their food, and we packed every morning. We packed in the evening certain things, and in the morning certain things, so they had everything fresh. And they brought water, and they brought fresh organic fruit, so that, so that they had a good day, and they stayed healthy. So we cut out the middleman. There is nothing we need from, for, or from all of these beautiful animals than unconditional love, back and forth. You know, somebody said, does lobsters feel pain when we put them in boiling water and they're still alive? Uh, it's like horrendous. What a question. And if you asked any child how you would, they would want to treat an animal, they would want to treat them like themselves, of course. But we don't see it that way. We see the meat in the package. That's how I was brought up. I look, I thought, I didn't put any connection that a cow was giving me this meat. I just saw the meat in a, in a package. Children who are educated will never be able to eat anything from an animal. Hippocrates said prevention is better than cure. Absolutely, that's the easy one. And that's what we try to teach here at the Institute too. <coughs> The myth of incomplete plant-based protein con com continues to thrive desp despite clear evidence of the contrary. Plants use the same amino acids as humans to build their cells. Eleven of them your body can make, and nine essential amino acids have to come from your diet. So 20 aminos, they're called Essential, the nine. Amino's genetic code is universal. So we are a gathering of cells which are held together and strengthened by amino acids. And children need more protein as they're growing, of course. And the natural source of calcium is plants. And Dr. Neil Barnard taught us about that. Of course, the Institute have been teaching that forever. Calcium is supporting our child's structure, growth, and maintenance. Without it, natural development cannot occur. And this, these are the two things that I get questions every day. Where do we get enough protein? And where do we get enough calcium? It comes from plants. And everything came from the sun, right? Everything started with photosynthesis. And it came down on this leaf, the green plants, that has everything for us. So we never had to worry. And I see, of course, here we see blood tests. Our medical team looked at blood tests before and after, and our program is 21 days. And you see, protein is never a problem. Calcium is never a problem. And a lot of people come with low or too high numbers, which is not good either way. Dairy is the main source of saturated fats. It causes heart disease, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's, breast and prostate cancers, and much, much more. And as British Medical Journal uh, told us, they said, no benefits for bone health. And this latest, a big study came out of Sweden, Lunds University. And it said, it warned us, it said, each glass of milk increases mortality risk by 15%. Well, I tell you, the, the, the dairy is only for a little baby calf to grow. It's not for us, and we've been paying a big price. So we can have milks made from plants, from nuts and seeds and grains. But you have to make sure it's organic, it's GMO-free, and 
is carrageen free. It's very important because it's all toxic otherwise. So healthier food ideas, yay. So what we would love, of course, things that we serve here. What if the children in school would have things like millet, quinoa, teff, amaranth, buckwheat. These are all gluten-free. Gluten-free bread. And what about organic ripe fresh fruit? What about organic nuts and nut milks, right? That would be amazing. Lunch or dinner. What about organic salad with sprouts, with sunflower sprouts, broccoli sprouts, mung bean sprouts? You know, there's so many. Flax crackers, avocado with its amazing essential fatty acid, the nuts, peppers, cucumbers, dulse, sprouted cooked beans, and you can make stew and you can make soups, veggie burgers, sweet potatoes, squash, hummus, chickpea spread, right? Gluten-free bread and wraps. Wouldn't that be amazing to have your child get this in school? It's a beautiful picture there. So, and these food are actually increasing nutrients generally over eight times. Imagine that. So then we have fruit. And fruit, you have actually numbers on fruit. Nine, uh, if there's finish on nine, the numbers, it means it's organic. If it has three or four, it's sprayed with pesticide. If it's an eight, it's actually GMO. So you want the nine, right? Well, World Health Organization, New review of 10 years shows that cancer, diabetes, and obesity may have links to hormone-disturbing substance that we get in us every day. And because grapes easily get moldy, they are sprayed with the highest amount of chemicals. So the dirty dozen are strawberries. Spinach, kale, collard, and mustard green, nectarines, apples, grapes, cherries, peaches, pears, bell and hot peppers, celery, tomatoes. So these are now fruits and vegetables that are so heavily sprayed that if you don't go organic, don't buy them. If you can't find organic, and of course the best place would be to go to a farmer's market and know who's selling and who's picking, and to pick, pick your own. And of course, to go local. With fruits, you go local, as fruit is mainly picked unripe. If I can go local and I can pick apples off the tree, they're going to be ripe. I remember, because I, rem uh, I ran the clinic in Sweden that I directed, we had an apple orchard, and it was amazing. By end of August, September, October maybe even, as the co it got colder climate, we could pick all the apples. And we picked them all down, and we had them until March the next year. And we had them in the root cellar, where they actually stayed amazingly good. So you got to watch with fruits. The World Health Organization says a healthy diet helps to protect against malnutrition in all its forms, as well as non-communicable disease like diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and cancer. Unhealthy diet and lack of physical activity are the leading global risks of health. So, you know, we are made up of 120 elements just like the table taught us. And very much it's soil-based stuff that we need. And our cells, each cells have, have um, the, so many mitochondria that are actually now hurt by EMF. 
EMF influences metabolic processes in the body. Kids are overexposed to it at an early age. The overuse has a more significant impact on a developing children and their brain. Blurry vision, dry eyes, sleep problem, anxiety, so eye strain, difficult to focus, right? So the powerhouse of our cells is mitochondria. And it's actually proven that it's disrupted by EMF. And our children are bombarded with this. So we could put our hand in the sand, not see and not hear and not talk. But I think as adults, we have a lot of responsibility, especially about education. When should education start? Well, get rid of academic training in kindergarten it may cause long-term harm. What the kids need, as we have a literacy crisis, they need to learn how to read. They need to learn how to play. And this is the deal right now. In the 1970s, 80% of kids in a school could read. Now they graduate and 35%. It is horrendous. So United National Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, they say, unless educational institutions internationally align what they do with these four challenges, climate change, democratic backsliding, growing social inequality, and growing social fragmentation, our future as human humanity is in peril. And this is Dr. Reimers, director of global education at Harvard. He says, unfortunately, the US education system is not designed to address these challenges. It's disconnected from reality. Growing social fragmentation and political polarization is invading our school and school boards. And, you know, when you look at what kids really should be learning, and when th places like Berkeley Earth is telling us that, that the Earth uh, is, the, the, we actually breaking the, the barrier by 2033 to, to get a, a way, way back. That is big time problem. Growing up, play bad, play based. <laughs> Psychology today state studies show if we don't play by kindergarten, you know, we need to. By third grade, any benefit of academic is lost. And by fourth grade, children are doing worse academically as well as socially and emotionally compared to those who were at play based kindergarten. So they find that kids, for example, that are brought up outside a city where they've had to play and learn the environment, they're much more flexible and it's very important for life to be flexible. Finland did amazing things. Well, first of all, they have the lowest rate of preschool enrollment and the highest level of schooling educational achievement. I mean, it's fantastic. And they do not begin the, really until the child is seven years old. And what they also did on the playground, they wanted to help kids that um, you know, we're a normal urban uh, playground school in, uh, play in uh, preschool. And they wanted to see what happens to their immune system and their gut microbiome, their flora. Well, this was like urban, you know, it's just concrete. So they brought in soil and they brought tons of leaves. So they brought the forest into the kids and they could play in it. 
and the T cell increase, the immune system, and the gut microbiome increased fantastic. So it was a great study to show what kids really need. Well, here is our Einstein, and he said, I have no special talent, but I'm only passionately curious, right? That's what we should all be. So then comes the fitness. And you know, that is more or less taken away from schooling, right? And this was Dr. Rete, uh, he wrote a book called um, The, the uh, Spark. It's a great book. Any teacher who's teaching fitness should read this because he did this in, uh, in uh, four schools in Illinois and to see how kids dwell, how they were doing if they had more fitness, more exercise. It was fantastic. They were doing so much better. They were scoring double the, uh, than everybody else in all the tests that the school had, but they had better mood. They felt better. And, you know, exercise is not really a part of uh, school anymore. It's not much. I know with my own kids, we had to do after school um, exercise with, with soccer and volleyball and running and all of that. It's unbelievable that it's not a part of school today. So the kids were more prepared and they definitely had better mood. So exercise in childhood. Most kids get less than 15 minutes of vigorous activity per day and a minimum of kids' exercise is an hour and a half. But it helps the kid to, to uh, process and everything and it helps to, to actually uh, help the brain. And it's the effect of exercise helps everything but it helps them grow and it's playful. Then we have posture and how we're sitting and how we're walking and the arch of our foot. We need to walk barefoot. It's very important for not only the feet but for all joints above the feet. Children should go barefoot, especially outside, in the grass, in the sand, because this allows the sensory receptors, proprioceptors, to develop, which play a large role in their balance. Imagine that. Then we get to clothing. <laughs> so children's toxic clothing. It's estimated over 8,000 synthetic chemicals are used in the fashion manufacturing process. This includes carcinogens and hormone disruptors. Get organic cotton, hemp, linen, that require little to no pesticides and lets your child skins breathe, right? So 25% of global pollution is the textile industry. And you have the waterproof, you have the stain resistant, wrinkle free, it goes on and on and on. These are forever chemicals. Forever chemicals will live in our nature thousands of years. Do we want to put our kids in these clothes? So fire retardants, the pesticides, all the things that are put into our kids' clothes, especially the clothes into their skin, is very important that we have clean, organic. You also have diapers the kids are in, and, and, and um, the, the chlorine and all kinds of petroleum-based stuff that the kids are sitting in all days. So, you know, there is a, uh, a business called GOTS, GOTS, the uh, certification, they have no chemicals, no dyes, uh, they only have plant dyes. And as our skin is the largest elimination organ, it's very, very important that we don't put pesticides and azo dyes and, and actually most of EU, uh, Europe, has banned these chemicals 
but they're still allowed here. It's terrible. So uh, we got to take care of our kids <laughs> in every way. Then we get to homeschooling. So homeschooling is happening now. And it's, it's something growing up like crazy. And there's a significant increase in homeschooling in 2020 from 3% to 12%. And homeschooling is parent-led, home-based education. And these kids score 15 to 30% above public school when they do tests. And, you know, parents are either the teachers or they hire um, educated teachers. But it's, kids are very happy doing this. Then we have Montessori schools. For more than a century now, the child-focused approach that Dr. Maria Montessori, an Italian physician, developed for educating children has been transforming school around the globe. The Montessori method fosters rigorous self-motivated growth for children and adolescents in all areas of the development, cognitive, emotional, social, and physical. Our children, our four children were lucky to have this as a part of their schooling. And Maria Montessori, creator of this, she said, when a child is given a little leeway, he will at once shout, I want to do it. But in our school, which have an environmental adapted to children's needs, they say, help me to do it alone. The first preschool, the first Montessori preschool opened in Rome, 1907. Like Waldorf schools, its focus is on children. Academics like math begins with materials to understand and children can be moved to lower or higher level classroom to take the time they need to be successful. So if a child, for example, needs more tutoring, they will make sure that that happens so they come up to where they should be. And this is not stressful. This is not meaning anything that the child is behind in any way. It just means that we want everybody to, to be as good as they can. Because every child has possibilities that are amazing. The wonderful Waldorf School. Waldorf School integrating art and academics for children, preschool through 12th grade. It inspiring lifelong learning in all students and to enable them to fully develop their unique capacities. It was founded in early 20th century based on Rudolf Steiner, anthropologist, scientist, artist. They use music, dance, theater, writing, and they have no competitive testing. How wonderful this is, and I've seen it in work. I've seen it very close to the clinic that I directed outside Stockholm in Sweden. And, you know, to use this music, dance, theater, academically, we're going to be so much more successful. And they know that music, for example, with the connection between brain and hands and the connection of the teamwork is helping academically and giving us stronger connections in the brain. Beneficial childhood programs. There's a lot of after-school programs that you can search for. One is called Girls on the Run. It's an after-school program all over the country, and its mission is fun, experience-based curriculum, insp inspiring girls to be joyful, healthy. We envision a world where every girl knows and activates her limitless potential and is free to boldly pursue her dreams. And 5K is the culmination of the 10-week program. They have this 10-week program that is so much fun and you're learning so much. And at the end, when you're fully trained in uh, running, <laughs> because this is Girls on the Run, they all do a 5K. So this is a very popular program. The next one is Dr. Oz in his health corpse that he created in 2003. This is school-based and organizational health education and peer mentoring in addition to community outreach to underserved population. 
learning life-saving skills in nutrition, fitness, and mental resilience, as well as hands-on CPR training. So this is fantastic, and um, you know, it is such a successful organization that helps so many kids after school. And you know, what could be better than teaching them about health, nutrition, and mental resilience? It's wonderful. Then we have one of our favorite people in the world, Betsy Braggs, 87 now. She created this Real Kids, Real Food. And she uh, has a mission to prevent obesity, chronic disease, and malnutrition, especially in children through education and advocacy of healthy living. Well, Betsy Bragg came here to the Institute many years ago and have a life-saving experience. I mean, it changed her whole life. She got on raw living food, became, of course, totally plant-based, and find that she wanted to help kids, and she wanted to educate them and be a part of that. And it is very successful, and you can all look that up. It's wonderful. Nelson Mandela. There can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. Nature has no accident. She will come to your rescue. So humble yourself by thanking for the abundance of life-enhancing gifts that it offers, especially your children. It takes a village. It's the toughest job ever to be a parent. So we are not alone the parent, grandparent, or foster parent. We have the, the teachers, we have the community, and we're all a part of their success or no. And it's so important that we, the, that we strive to make the next generation's life, environment, amazing, the clothes they wear, the food they eat, that they don't have to live in anxiety and fear of what's gonna happen in future. So we, we thank you for the time. And you know, if, if this opened your eyes, I'd be so happy. We here at the Institute at Hippocrates Wellness, every day we try to make it a better place in the world. And you can too. So thank you and enjoy my son Blake's music here. Into arms you call to me Settle down for another play One step and you're walking away We knew we would come to this day And now it's all left to say goodbye Waterfalls and it catches itself I fall and you catch me away We're gonna be there by your side Thank you. What, a, what an amazing and very meaningful presentation. We really, really appreciate that. Um, before we jump into the Q&A, if you want to remind everybody, where's the best place to reach you? And, and if people want to buy your books, where's the best place to do that? Well, the best is Hippocrates uh, Institute, hippocratesins.org. And uh, you look up uh, under Hippocrates Wellness, you'll see uh, lots of videos. You see our our um, legends, 100.3, every, every interview we've done there. And of course, the real truth about health. So the Hippocrates Health Institute, our phone number is 561-471-8876. 561-471-8876. We look forward to hearing from you. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. And so... As we're about to jump into our live q and A, I I want to make sure that everyone on our end in our audience knows how to do this. And so normally we don't take questions directly from the chat box. We ask everyone to raise their hand with their question. And in case you're not sure 
how to raise your virtual hand. Uh, generally, there's uh, different tabs at the bottom of your Zoom window, and you'll click on the tab that says reactions. Once you click on your reactions tab, you'll see a few different emojis and functions pop up. One of them says raise hand. You'll click on that, and we will see your raised hand, and we'll go ahead and take raised hands in the order in which they come in. And when it's your turn, I will actually call you by your first name and I'll unmute you from here and you'll be able to ask Anna Maria your questions. So with that, everybody raise your hand, if you will. And I already see a couple of raised hands, which is terrific. And Anna Maria, if you're ready, we'll jump right in. I'm ready. Excellent. Thank you so much. So up first, we have Kaylee. Kaylee, I am unmuting you now. Welcome. Hi. Hi, Anna Maria. Thank you so Hi. much especially for pr pr bringing up the music and art, the importance of music and art for children and the playing of instruments, how they use their hands and how that connects with the mind and the brain right. development and making without judgment available all the different kinds of media to draw with. If you could go into that a little more for everybody, I think that's one of the most ignored important things in the world. <laughs> oh my gosh. And, and, you know, I play, I play violin, I play guitar, I play, uh, uh, all kinds of instruments. But the thing is, of course, that's been helping me all my life. Uh, it's uh, when music gets into your life and the earlier it does, the better. Yes, of course, it's the hand, hand the eye, the coordination, the, the mind coordination, and also the team, the teamwork. I, I'm a part of a team when I play music. And uh, what it does to your science skills and, and how it increases you in math and science, absolutely. I think there's tons of research of that, but it really should be a part of school. It should be a part that you, we have different instrument and, and we, you know, we, we kind of attracted, um, Brian plays drum, he's a drummer. And so some of the boys might be attracted to that. My brother played clarinet. I mean, he was fantastic playing clarinet. And, uh, he, you know, he kind of stopped because there was mainly just girls that were playing in the, in the little orchestra that the school made. So we, we did. And when I grew up, we did have some music in school. But I know it's, it's only in Waldorf or Montessori that, uh, that is available or homeschooling. But it's fantastic for brain development. And there are many studies that has been done showing that when I learn an instrument, a part of my brain actually grows. And, you know, for us, after 40 years old, our brain actually starts shrinking a little bit by little. And this keeps our brain in good shape. So uh, for our memory to prevent things, maybe to prevent Alzheimer even, I think music is fantastic and maybe it prolongs our mind much longer. So uh, thank you for that because that's, uh, I, I love music. It's, uh, I mean, here we play, we always have music at the Institute. I have music in my room. I have classical music in my office. I, I can't live without it. It's, uh, Uh, it, nobody should live without music, whatever instrument they want to play, but any parent could encourage that. And of course, you hear about Suzuki and, and the violins and, and kids starts. And it, I do it all by ear. You either learn to, to read uh, music or you do it by ear. I, I, I know how to read music, but, but my brain wants to do it by ear. I want to hear something and then pick it up. And it, it's really amazing to play. And uh, we, uh, a lot of our team here plays music too. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, it kind of goes hand in hand with uh, how we, uh, what we think alike too. And it definitely art goes hand in hand with this too. Every artist that comes here, every painter or musician, they love what we do because they appreciate it. They appreciate the food, the beauty of the food. I mean, most food that was cooked and was meat and chicken, that's just gray stuff. This is gorgeous, beautiful, green color. It's pink, it's, um, it's yellow, it's uh, red, and it's, it's just gorgeous. Thank you for that question. Thank you so much, Anna Maria. And yeah. uh, up next, we have Sophia. Welcome, Sophia. Hi. Thank you so much for taking my question. Please, yeah, hi. Uh, what milk please to give to a baby if a mom can't breastfeed? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that is a big question. Okay. So then I have to go to an animal that's closer to me because I do need milk for the first two years. Of course, if I can nurse, I nurse for two years. It, it's the best that I can do. So the next best, I don't go to a cow. If the cow is going to grow, you know, they nearly thousand pound. A calf is going to grow thousand pound in a year. So I go to the next best, which would be a goat. So then I can give goat milk. Is that really enough? No, not, not really. And so I can add things like blue green algae. Blue green algae, you have uh, amazing essential fatty acids in there. And that are, your brain is 60% fat. So the blue green algae uh, has, six, has the same fat as the brain needs. And essential fatty acids, for example, uh, you know, the essential fatty acids is something we need every day. We need to get it in. We don't make it. Just like the protein, you have the 20, 11 are you can make, but nine are essential. You need to get it from the food. So you might have to add something uh, that will make it complete, like some blue-green algae and um, the goat milk. So if you could add, if you can add a little bit of mother's milk, if, if, you, if you can nurse somewhat, I would do whatever you have, even if it's once a day, it's better than nothing. So but that, that's been the alternative. And uh, we, had, uh, we had a mother come with her child who was seven months old that had rash because she was on formula. She couldn't nurse. She was on uh, one of the normal formula and she had a rash all over her body, was suffering so much. And uh, I found um, a, uh, a farm that has goats. And, uh, but the problem is you need raw goat's milk. You don't need pasteurized and homogenized uh, deaths like the milk is. That's, it's a killer. It's actually should have a death skull milk. Death skull um, painted on the, the milk carton. So it has to be raw. So I found somebody that, uh, that could give me raw goat's milk. And you should see that rash disappeared in a week. And the child was so happy, could smile again, was crying and crying before. And so, yes, so that is, that is the closest alternative. Thank you for the question. Thanks very much for that, Anna Maria. And actually, before we move on to our next question, um, I'm not sure. It sound, something sounds kind of funny with your microphone. I don't know if it's rubbing against your clothes or your hair. Oh, but you just sorry. Readjust it just a touch. I, maybe I just hold it. Uh, that's, I'll just that's hold good. it. Is it better? Actually, it's funny. We're still hearing a little something funny, but it is better. It's um, better? Okay, I'll hold it. Actually, you can put no. it back on your coat. I'm not so sure there was much of a difference. I just, <laughs> there was something kind of funny happening there, but. Uh, well, it probably was rubbing. I put it here. I think that's a little better. Thank you. That's better? Yeah. And so let's okay. um, let's go ahead now to Monty. Monty, you are unmuted. Welcome. Hi. Uh, great lecture. Um, for sprouted beans and uh, and our grains, uh, do we have to to cook them? And how long uh, does it take to? How do we cook? Like, can we steam them? And does it affect the nutritional quality or the vitamins? So the last thing was about vitamins. Yeah, does the um, the cooking affect the vitamin content in the oh absolutely pro- okay yeah in the sprouted greens or beans? Yeah, so beans, so I can eat beans raw, but I need to sprout them. So what we do, I take a bowl and I soak every bean, every bean I soak overnight, and then I rinse it well. And to make it easier, I just usually pour it over in a colander you know, the spaghetti strainer, and I rinse it twice a day for two or for two, usually one or two days, depending on. Sometimes I have to put them in the fridge to sprout because the kitchen is too hot. And so that then takes a little bit longer. But see, now the bean is going to grow a little sprout. When you sprout, the deal is why I soak, I get rid of something called an enzyme inhibitor that actually inhibits me to actually digest it well. And then I have the sprouting process. I break down protein to amino acids. 
I break down fat to fatty acid and carbs to simple sugar. And this helps the whole process. And especially if somebody has diabetes, imagine, I mean, the body now takes carbs and they need to be digested to sugar. And the way I'm gonna do that is that I need to make, the pancreas need to make insulin so that I can bring that sugar into my cells. So it's an amazing process that happens. And so then the problem is when I have diabetes that I, that I, don't, I don't digest, I can't get the, the insulin to bring it in. And it has a lot to do with the fats in my diet. So now this is simple sugar. This is easy to get into my cells and this will help anybody with diabetes. Again, Sprouting. The sprouting makes it. Anna Maria, Anna Maria, I'm sorry to cut you off. We okay. seem to have lost your volume. I have a funny feeling that maybe there's a bad battery in that microphone. Oh. Because I, I, it's coming in and out now, and we lost the last so, 30 seconds of your. Okay, uh, I'll do it again. Thing. Yeah. Can you hear me now? We can hear you better now when you do that, and uh, okay. hopefully it'll be okay. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. The technology will always have problem here. <laughs> One and of these you, days we'll... And you don't have to hold it too close, but just maybe a foot away from your mouth. That's okay, good. Okay, I'll put it... Okay. So maybe I'll take the whole thing over. Sure. Okay. So, <laughs> so when we soak uh, a bean, for example, so all beans need to be soaked overnight, we actually break down. And soaking means I get a bowl, I put the beans, I fill it up with water, let it sit overnight, and I get rid of enzyme inhibitor so that life can actually now start so I can sprout. And now when I'm sprouting, I usually just throw it into a colander, rinse it well, and then I either let them sprout on my counter and, or I sprout them in the fridge and that will delay the time a little bit, but uh, it works. They still sprout because that life, that bean has life inside. If it's cut, if it's cut, of course, then I can't get any life. It has to be whole, it's same with whole grains, beans, seeds, nuts. People ask me about cut oats. It can't sprout, you know, so I can get, if I want to use oats, I can have, oat groats that I can soak and sprout. So you break down protein to amino acid by sprouting, carbs to simple sugar, and fat to fatty acid, which helps anybody with diabetes, for example, because the carbs have to be now broken down to sugars so that the insulin can bring it into your cells and you get fuel, it's your fuel, you get energy. And with diabetes, this is a problem. And with a carnivorous diet, with all that saturated and the trans fat, that just covers the cells so that insulin can even bring it in. And it's a big problem. We need to get off all, all animal-based foods to help yourself first. So when it comes to the nutrients that are lost when I cook these beans now, because I could have eaten them raw and make dishes out of them. If I cook, I still have a lot of the proteins and I have some um, uh, fat-based uh, minerals. And uh, so there is still nourishment. Of course, not the same as the phytochemicals that I could get from the food that is raw and alive and sprouted. So... Vitamins that when you cook anything, if I take now, let's say um, some beautiful cabbage and I eat the cabbage as it is, as it is which is, has sulforaphane, the broccoli sprouts are amazing in that, but it's, it's a great source if it's organic, of course, because it's heavily sprayed otherwise, then um, I uh, get everything. But if I cook that cabbage, I get some but I, I sure don't get the life force. And Brian has a book called Life Force. You know, the, it's, uh, it teaches you the whole thing about if I'm eating things like they were meant to. When I picked, uh, for example, this morning, I was out picking arugula for our kitchen. And when you pick that arugula and you eat it right as it came right from the soil, you're getting some amazing microbes too, because microbes are soil-based. All the 120 elements that you have in the um, elements 
are in your body in the soil. We're all one. We're all one, but we've we're missing a lot lately. We're missing, and kids are the ones that are suffering the most because they are building their future on missing. This is what this is why I wanted to do this whole lecture about that we have to change the way we think about future and we need to have schooling that's teaching them to take care of them and to flourish and to blossom but we are the ones to protect them so the less we cook we can say that 80 percent of your diet should be raw and 20 percent can be cooked soups, stews with uh, plants and beans and grains and have fun with squash and amazing de delicious uh, things that we can do. And we have all we have a lot of this on our website that you can look up under Hippocrates Wellness too. And we have an amazing cookbook that I brought with Kelly Serbonix, uh, our previous chef, and it's called Healthful Cuisine, Healthful Cuisine. And that's all raw living uh, things. And you know, when kids really get going, I, I see kids here the first week, there is not that much on their plate and our buffet is fantastic. We have fantastic chefs. And after three weeks here, the third week, they start piling up. That sprout, that sprout, sunflower sprouts, pea sprouts, buckwheat sprouts, broccoli sprouts, onion sprouts, garlic sprouts, and they want to test everything. So it's being the model, it's being that and... Um, so the less cooked, the better. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Excellent. Thanks very much, Anna Maria. And now we're going to bring in Ray. Welcome, Ray. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? We can. I thank you. you. Yeah, thank you, Anna Maria, and also the Real True for Health uh, program. Uh, I live in a colder climate, but I think you just answer my question. Uh, I have a plant-based diet for, for years. And if I want to gradually move into a live food uh, diet, and what book, if you hadn't already mentioned, what book would be helpful? Uh, because yeah. several years, I mean, months, you know, I'm in this cold weather. Yeah. So thank you for that, Ray. So the deal is the Institute started off in Boston. And we were there for 30 years. Our founder, Ann Bigmore, founded it in 1956, the year I was born. <laughs> and so 66 years with the Institute has been, uh, been um, around. And 30 years were in Boston. And Boston is cold. It's windy. Hey, I'm from Stockholm. I never was as cold in Stockholm as I was in Boston. So we proved, and we were proud to prove it there that it works. And I came there in 1980, and, and you know, it was to prove that raw food works in Boston. We had nothing cooked in Boston. We only had raw food. We started here because we have been here in Florida for 35 years now. Uh, going on at 36 years, and we had to modify the program a little bit because you evolve, times evolve, and people are actually more malnutritious now than ever, so they need raw living food, but their digestive tract was so used to heavy processed food that for some people, I have to uh, have some steamed vegetables, some hot cereal, and, but of course, I promote 100% raw living food for healing, healing of any, any problem. So uh, that's, that should be your answer. It definitely works in a, in a cold climate, but we have this emotional uh, connection that we need, we need something hot. We need hot soup, we need hot tea, and hot tea is fine. If it's caffeine-free and it's totally herbal, organic, Hot tea is fine. We serve it here too. But uh, the main staple of your diet should be raw living. Absolutely. And so there are a lot of books. My husband has written Life Force and Living Food for Optimum Health. It tells the whole story. And I have uh, the raw food cookbook called uh, Healthful Cuisine, like healthful cuisine. 
and there's uh, you know there's a lot of vegan plant-based cookbooks out there of course for that reason so but when it comes to the raw that's um, i think that knowledge is the most important and understand why why is raw food the best food that i can eat and how do i do it because people are wondering how do, how do i nourish my child um, and where do, where are they getting protein plant protein is plant-based calcium is plant-based that's where every animal gets it from. <laughs> so, you know, un unless they're carnivore, they eat, uh, they eat an herbivore, an omnivore, they, that's their food. So they, they, we all are plant-based. Thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you, Anna Maria. And thank so you. now we're going to move on to uh, Thomas. Welcome, Thomas. Thank, thank you very much. Dr. Clement, I love your work. You and your husband, you are the best. And I, I didn't catch, I didn't catch all of your lecture, and I hope this question is not redundant. Uh, in the late 50s and 60s, a lot of doctors did tonsillectomies. Uh, two questions. Can you tell me the consequences of having a person without tonsils? And the other question is. Is this preventable with children if you give a good plant pace, a, a plant based diet? That's my Excellent. question. Excellent. Thank you, Thomas. Excellent. Thank question. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yes. So tonsillitis and tonsillectomy. Um, I always joke about that. It's not even a joke. If you're Brian's generation, who's 70 now and born in America, you probably don't have tonsils. I'm from Sweden. I, I got to keep mine. Well, and they were probably inflamed many, many times. And so the, the first thing we would do in, uh, in, in the case of tonsillitis, uh, of course, is to change the diet, get rid of gluten, get rid of dairy, which is the biggest part of that. And, and the problem is, if I go plant-based and I go natural, I can use a lot of natural supplements. Of course, probiotic would be there and algae would be there, blue-green algae and chlorella to nourish the child. And, you know, it usually ends up with allergies. It can be allergies. Uh, it can be um, my uh, uh, rash. It could be rashes, eczema. It could be just um, for um, my uh, lungs to have problems with colds, often colds, because it's my first defense. That's where you have four lymph, you have four lymph glands. You have your tonsils, thymus, spleen, and appendix. So this is major. That's where you actually have white blood cells to con con contract or um, to, to, to combat any virus, bacteria, anything that comes in that should not have a chance to get into your system. So it, it often leads to asthma and uh, other uh, uh, problems with my lungs. It can lead to severe allergy. It can lead to sinus infection. I mean, people are suffering. This is crazy. And so the first thing, if it even comes to it, that we need to have this surgery, I would give it three months first. I would give three months, 100% raw living food sprouts, and take away some of the, for a child, I wouldn't take all the fruits away, but I, I would take any dried fruit, bananas, any heavy sugar uh, fruits, and I would leave maybe berries. I would leave the berries, blueberries, blackberries, uh, strawberries, raspberries, would leave that so that they have that. But, and, but the deal is the more juices that I can get into them now and nourish them fast, our juice here is sunflower sprouts, pea sprouts, celery, and cucumber. And when kids are here, we have, we have three kids here right now as part of the, their parents are here with them. And they love the juices. Wheatgrass, I'd, I'd let kids get into wheatgrass on their own like I did my own kids. My own kids started usually with wheatgrass when they were like three years old and they had a little bit like a teaspoon of it and uh, see how it worked on them. Here, of course, as adults, we drink two ounces twice a day. It's pure medicine. It, it's uh, fantastic. I drink it every day and I drink 
green juice. We serve 16 ounces twice a day here. So our guests are very, very nourished. And that after two years old, that becomes kind of the new milk. That is the milk for the kids. And of course you can make grain milks and uh, you can make a nut milks or you can buy them, but then you know, that absolutely has to be organics and no carrageen in the ingredients there. And, and one good rule, when you buy something in a store, then uh, realize if it's not organic, it's probably full of pesticides, GMO and uh, fertilizers and herbicides. That's what you're feeding your kids. So thank you. <laughs> Th thank you very much for that. And uh, let's see now, we have got Gail coming in with a question and welcome Gail. Hi, um, great to be here. Um, Anna, Anna Marie, I just wondered, you were talking about sprouting the beans and, and although that I know that's obviously the best way, what, how is it about when we, we've been doing the quick soaking method, method where you um, boil them for two minutes and then let them sit for an hour before cooking them? Is that okay to do or, or would you advise against that? They're not going to sprout after that. They will cook. They will cook faster, but then they're not going to sprout after that. You know, if I take any grain and I want to put it in the soil to grow, uh, let's say I have arugula seeds. If I if I boil them even for ever so fast, they're not going to grow. I'm not going to get anything. So the life force is gone. And I know it's it makes things easier and faster. But how? much in a hurry are we for, for example the microwave oven those we should throw out throw them out it nukes you nukes your kids nukes your food not a good idea so um it's it's not a good idea no it's not going to grow it's not going to sprout after that thanks anna maria <laughs> and um at the moment i don't see any other raised hands so i've got a couple of questions for you if that's okay, okay. um but i just do want to remind everybody what a great opportunity here with Anna Maria Clement. We've got her for uh, a bit more time. And so if anybody wants to raise their hand, if you're not sure how to, all you need to do is go down to the bottom of your Zoom screen. In fact, I already see a few more hands popping in already, which is great. Thank you. And I'll remind okay. everybody else, you just got to click on your <laughs> reaction <laughs> tab. That's right. Uh, just got to click on your reactions tab. And when you do that, uh, you'll see the raise hand function. You can click on that and we'll we'll take your hand as soon as we uh, can get to it in the order in which they come in. And so with that, uh, we are pleased to welcome in Ben. Ben, welcome. Yes, thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, have the meeting. So I'm sorry I asked you one question because um, I heard the lectin in the, you know, the plan. So uh, do you think if it's the raw, um, the lectin will hurt us? If there's lectin in grains and beans, yes, of, they're, if they're raw and not soaked and sprouted, yes, but once you sprout, you get rid of it. So that is not a problem, not a problem. But the more I sprout, even if I cook, I sprout things. If I wanna do a lentil soup, I soak them overnight, I sprout them 24 hours, and then the lectin is gone, no problem. So when in doubt, sprout. When in doubt, sprout. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Absolutely. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. And now Thank we you. have uh, Kaylee coming in. Hi, Kaylee. Hi. Hi. Thank you for taking me again. Uh, two, a couple of things, just short things. One is I love the quote that you gave us about I have no special talent. I am just passionately curious from Einstein. I love that. Thank you so much. And um, I want to relate that also to, uh, to back to art. Um, in the terms of the visual arts, how often children will draw things and they'll use all kinds of colors and they'll make uh, trees different colors than they would be in nature and parents are judgmental about it. And I just wanted to warn about the judgmental part rather than just appreciating people's curiosity and, and, and creativity. Um, and, and I think that makes them so much more open to things, including, and I wondered if you had any information about, uh, about this in terms of music with plants that I know at Duke University, they were doing experiments many years ago and they found that plants grow best to Mozart. 
and uh, and and, and that classical music altogether is very healing and very soothing for plants as well as people. Um, and I wondered if you could expound on that a little more. <laughs> I just talk by my own experience. Of course, here in our greenhouse, we play Mozart. I mean, there's, it's, uh, the plants love it. And I have classical music in my office 24 seven. It's on, it's amazing. It keeps me focused, keeps me prepared. Um, I think that the sound, sound therapy, which we also have here at the Institute, sound therapy is amazing to work with the brain to work with the stresses that we have in daily life, the pollution. I mean, everything comes to the brain. We have something called the BBB, blood brain barrier. Everything from the gut is eventually going up into the brain and giving measures and back, back and forth, actually giving information. So this communication between everything and music Music uh, is so important for brain development for children. I, I can't talk enough about that. And the earlier we start, kindergarten, fun, having play, and like you said, art with the colors, working in colors, that is so important for the brain development. And it's lost, you know, it's lost. All school, schooling teaches, unfortunately, a lot of nonsense that we don't need. We don't need it now when we are in a time when times have changed and we are actually talking about climate change. We're talking about the window of change is close, closing up on us. And then, I mean, when science tells us by 2033, you know, unless we change, unless we stop fishing like we do, stop it, let our oceans heal. If we let our lakes heal, if we let our soil heal and we grow organic and we stop with everything and we have the kids in school, that's why now you have homeschooling. It's just going crazy. One of our daughters is homeschooling, belong to a pod of six families and amazing. The kids are flourishing. They're happy. They're, they're, they're going to score better than anybody and any college is going to want to have them. So music around us is very important. And, you know, if you see surgeons, they even put classical music when they do surgery because the, the, the person that have the surgery actually takes it in and survives the surgery so much better and heals so much faster. Thank you all for that. Thanks very much, Anna Maria. And uh, looks like Sophia is back with the follow-up. Welcome, Sophia. Thank you so much. Uh, if a person is allergic to algae and walnut, hemp seeds, um, what alternative for omega-3s? Is, is uh, flaxseed enough? So no, you get omega-3 from so many other things. So uh, yes, it, 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 can you eat avocado? Avocado is a great one. And of course, olives is great. Olive oil, hemp oil would be great. Um, if they're allergic to all algae and chlorella, then uh, sometimes what happens when you go 100% raw living plant-based, a lot of these allergies go. So that is not impossible. A lot of allergies that people come, they tell me they're allergic to cucumber or, or you know, a lot of things that we serve. And I say, okay, so let's stay out of them for now. We can make the juice without it. But then usually uh, later on, they're like, you know what? I want to try it. I want to see. And most of the time, they are not allergic anymore. They don't have a reaction anymore. So a lot of allergies comes from the food we were eating and the, the good stuff we didn't get. And the movement and the stress in our life and the pollution. And as I talked about EMF, and EMF is a big disturbance for allergies, big time. So we might have to limit what we use. We have to protect ourselves. Uh, you know, there's a lot of ways. We have the pulse, the pulse I wear it all the time. This is actually helps to, <laughs> to uh, protect me from, it works like a lightning rod. And we have Shanghai. Shanghai is very important. I, I wear Shanghai as a bracelet all the time to protect. And my kids, my grandkids, everybody wears this. They wear it all day long. And they're proud to wear it because it, it's helping them protect because every child is going to be on computers today 
it's the time we live in and my kids have been, uh, there is nothing, uh, my young son studying medicine and of course it's very much EMF and he's, he's protecting all the way that he can. And uh, he, uh, he realizes that he needs to never wear the, the phone on him, on his body. They know now, for example, that men and women, we, the, it's, we have reproductive problems. We actually have reproductive problems from the EMF and especially, and never wear it in your pocket for men and women. So um, I think uh, hopefully that answers you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Anna Maria. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And now let's go to Kathy. Welcome, Kathy. Oh, hang on, Kathy, somehow. Let me unmute you. There you go. Hi, Kathy. Okay. Hi. Hi, Anna Maria. I want to thank you very much for bringing up music and talking about how important it is. It's a huge, uh, it's a huge part of my life. I think the only time I'm not listening to music is if I'm listening to you or Brian talk. <laughs> but anyway, um, a question I had for you. Yeah. What do you think about chiropractic care for children? Oh. I, I mean, my kids have been exposed to everything because we have it here. And I think chiropractic is very important. I think physiotherapy, I talked a little bit about that with, the, with walk, children walking barefoot and their posture. If they don't get to walk barefoot, if they're in their shoes and boots most of the time, it is a big problem because you have three arches under the foot and it actually works on the whole posture, our whole body. And we, we can actually have problems for the rest of our life because we didn't have the possibility to walk barefoot when we were really young. So that is, that's very important. Uh, chiropractic, of course, I think structural alignment is very important and all of us can, can have that. We work with chiropractors. We have one here at the property uh, as part of our team. We also work with um, Nuka, who is upper cervical. And it's fantastic when kids have uh, con concussion or, um, or elders, we have vertigo. I mean, it fixes it. I've seen amazing or just balance and getting structurally aligned because it's all, it's all up here, C1 and C2. So sometimes we need to fix that. And then we, know, then we do chiropractic, then we do physiotherapy, massage. I mean, my kids have been exposed to everything and they live that life now. They keep it. They go to naturopaths. Uh, they go to naturopathic doctors if they're not here with us and they need help for their kids, like in, in Washington State, Oregon. Uh, it's, um, it's a big part of our kids' life to use natural methods when they need them. So absolute chiropractic, love it, love it. Thanks very much, Anna Maria. And let's see now. Now we have uh, Monty is back with a follow-up. And go right ahead. Hi, Monty. Okay, I'm about to grow an array of grains and beans in my garden this year. Uh, I won't. I don't need to sprout them, right? I can just go ahead and get them fresh from the uh, from the plant and have them uh, because they are still in their green state, right? You can. And, and forgive me, I'm sorry to interrupt, Anna Maria, but um, your mic is still kind of playing with us. So now I told you to hold it a little further away. Now, if you could hold it a little closer, I think that'd be helpful. Hold it closer. Yeah, that'll be great. Thank you. Okay, so now you hear me. We, okay, yeah, so it's a little I, better one. Yeah. So the beans that you just pick in your garden, of course, you could eat them like they are. You can eat them right there and then. You don't have to cook them. Most of them are perfectly fine like that. If you want, you could soak and sprout them. Uh, if you have fava beans, lima beans, you probably need to soak them uh, at least um, and before you eat them. But no, they're fine. I mean, I pick things all the time from the garden and I eat them just like that. They're, they're perfect. But when they're dry, you know, this, when they're dry, you, I need to soak them and sprout them. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. And now we have uh, Dave. Hi, Dave. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, Anna Marie. Great presentation. Hi. And I agree with a lot of what you say. It's not my first time. I've, I've heard you and your husband before many times. And 
it's very interesting because I grew up in Europe, actually Ukraine, um, and I moved to the U.S. when I was nine. And we spent a lot more time outdoors. And so I didn't know. And a lot of the things that you talk about exactly is how we grew up. Like, so we played in the dirt and I didn't know anybody that had allergies growing up, you know, a lot of the health issues. But and and I noticed in the U.S. it's very different. You know, all my friends I grew up with have some kind of allergies, even with the kids and everything. Um, you know, you can't bring peanuts to school. A lot of things were just more in, more indoors, more, um, you know, secluded, so to speak, a lot more synthetic. So the world is changing. Um, but the question I had was about just out of curiosity about feeding. I feel like, you know, I've been eating plant based and um, I feel like you have to get so many different ingredients in throughout the day. And now there's this whole push, you know, just having one meal a day. So I wanted to get your opinion. How do you and your husband, do you eat multiple meals throughout the day? Because I feel like if I eat, for example, a breakfast of oatmeal with fruit, I'm full for the rest of the day and I have to force myself to eat, you know, like a green salad and beans and all that. And, and so just out of curiosity, what, what are your daily, you know, feeding practices, so to speak? Sorry, that was a winded yeah. comment. But. <laughs> wow. hey, we are feeding practice. Well, and you know, you're so right. Being brought up in Europe, it, it was a whole different deal. And, and I feel for Ukraine, um, I'm sure it's uh, heartbreaking, uh, I talked to my dad, who is in Sweden, of course, and uh, uh, who's 94 now. He's totally heartbroken. He said, I can't believe it's happening now. I can't believe the world is letting this happen. So it's, uh, it's uh, you know, our heart is with you and everybody in Ukraine. The thing is, um, our, of course, you know, I've, I've been through so many different uh, eating, three times a day, eating twice a day, eating once a day. I'm, on, I'm 66 now. I don't need to eat three times a day. I don't need all that energy because the energy I need, I get very much from juice. So the juice, the green juice that we make here is 50% sprouts. It's sunflower and pea sprouts. Amazing. Amino acid, essential fatty acid, protein, you name it, vitamins. It's great. And then we add celery and cucumber. And of course, celery is the organic sodium and cucumber is loaded with uh, good minerals plus it's hydrating. So we drink that. We drink 16 ounces, which is half a liter twice a day. And we have wheatgrass that I have like four ounces a day. And the wheatgrass, two ounces of wheatgrass is worth five pounds of vegetables. So I would have to sit to eat five pounds. Talk about fast food. <laughs> so that gives me so much energy. So I eat one meal a day, but it's a big salad. And it has all the sprouts. And then sometimes I eat a hot meal after that, but most of the time that salad, just like you said about the oatmeal, it fills me up so much, I really don't have room for anything cooked. When you start the morning with something raw, like a green juice, and maybe a raw cereal, where we soak and sprout millet, quinoa, we can, I sprout them in the fridge, actually, I let them sit and sprout for three, four days, and they're gorgeous, and I can make crackers out of them, I can put them in the dehydrator as a bread or a cracker, or I just eat them like a cereal, then uh, that doesn't fill me up the same as cooked food, cooked food does, and by the way, fruits and grains when it comes to food combining, we don't combine it. If I choose fruit, I have fruit. If I, and then I would have to wait maybe a half an hour, an hour, and then have a cereal. Because fruit are fantastic detoxifier. And kids, of course, can have much more fruit than an adult because we are sugar addicts. And we have a lot of problems from all the sugar that we get. Like you said, we hardly saw allergies. And why does America have so much of this? We have a lot we are a very young country i love america i'm an american citizen too as i'm swedish citizen but i it's because it's so young it doesn't have cultures it doesn't really have food cultures and it's funny because we all came from somewhere except the native americans that knew exactly how to feed themselves and who actually we think of them that they ate just bison. They ate a lot of herbs and plants, of course, just like the Same in, in northern Sweden and Norway and Finland. The Same is our natives 
who knew so much about herbs to, to help them. The thing is why we uh, have a lot of that, we are very much into processed food here and we are definitely sugar addicts. There's so much sugar in our food and there's, there is unfortunately no regulations, no regulations of food. And you think what's on the shelves in the store is somebody looked after it, made sure you're not gonna get a problem from this, that your little kids or grandkids are not gonna get sick from this. There is none. At the end of the day, there is none. And they, they come out with regulations and it's, it's a big, you know, it's the corporations that, that more or less pay, pay lobbyists so they get away with it. They get away with murder. They have a lot of blood on their hands, a lot of blood. Thank you. Um, thank you very, very, very much, Anna Maria. And uh, folks, I'm sorry, we are up against the clock. It's time for us to bring out our next speaker. And so uh, we may have to drop a question or two. I apologize to those. Please, please come back with more questions later. In the meantime, Anna Maria, my goodness, thank you so, so much again for the last nine years and all of your support along the way and everything you shared here today and being so gracious with your time to answer questions as well. And we just really, really appreciate it. And, you know, I'm not the only person that wants to thank you. So we're going to ask our tech team to unmute our entire audience. Please, everybody, what would you like to say to Anna Maria Clement? Oh,